Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session of the Autism Parenting Summit. My name is Joshua. I'm the editor of Autism Parenting Magazine. And in this session, we are speaking to Dr. Travis Whitney, and he is speaking to us on umbilical cord stem cell therapy and integrative medicine in autism spectrum disorder. So he's the founder of the Innate Healthcare Institute in Arizona, and he's going to unpack um, what they do at the Institute and how you can get involved. Dr. Travis Whitney, thank you for your time and welcome to the Autism Parenting Summit. Hi, everyone. Dr. Travis Whitney with Innate Healthcare Institute. And today we are going to be talking about umbilical cord stem cell therapy and integrative medicine in autism spectrum disorder. So a little bit about myself, first of all, uh, born and raised in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. My bachelor's was in psychology with a minor in philosophical and religious studies. Um, was super, super into that uh, for a while. I used to give presentations on neurotheology, which is the study of the brain and its interaction with spirituality and religious experience. And um, after a little brief stint in the army, I found naturopathic medicine and, and I graduated with a dual program, a doctorate in naturopathic medicine and a master's in integrated medical research. And then a little bit after that, I studied Chinese medicine and graduated with my master's in that uh, down here in Phoenix. Um, I did the other doctorate and master's up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so here's some uh, organizational memberships, some um, trainings, uh, affiliations um, I'm part of. Pretty much um, the bulk, pretty much almost 100% of my practice now is uh, stem cell medicine or regenerative medicine is, is a more common term for it. Um, so it's pretty much what I've been doing pretty much full time uh, for almost the last 10 years. Um, here's another one of our physicians, uh, Dr. Alexei. Uh, we'll go over in my history with, uh, with autism. And um, I brought Dr. Alexei in a couple of years ago and um, she has a great background in autoimmune diseases and especially using uh, nutrition and natural, more of a holistic natural approach with autoimmune conditions. And for me, that was really important with autism, um, as we'll go over a little later in this presentation, uh, because autism is acts very much like an autoimmune condition. And there's some really interesting research uh, to back that up. So Dr. Lexi works with um, pretty much the majority of our kids uh, that we see here um, in Phoenix. Um, you know, I'll go back to that. I, I will say, um, a little bit more about Innate Healthcare Institute. So we are located in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, don't think I have a slide about the clinic, uh, but we are located in Phoenix, Arizona. We are the first, and I believe the only so far, uh, clinic in the US that uses umbilical cord, uh, live umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, so this is our cell biologist, uh, Dr. Indra Paul Singh. He goes by Indy. Um, I, I, couldn't even begin to fill up uh, this slide with his uh, his uh, past experience. So I, I kind of picked some of the most um, recent and relevant ones. Uh, very, very long uh, history yeah, um, and, and works now or was working before he joined us at the Phoenix Children's Hospital uh, doing some uh, research in autism as well there. Um, our One of our our scientific advisor and another cell biologist is Dr. Pravan Rajanahali. He's been a huge, huge ads, asset to us uh, since day one um, for for our cell development, our stem cell development. Um, really funny and really bright and smart guy when it comes to cell biology uh, and, and stem cell and exosome um, physiology. Um, Cece, uh, Christina, it goes by Cece. Uh, she's our autism communication specialist here. Um, really bright. She kind of, um, what's the right word to use? She kind of buffs the the traditional system where it's kind of this one size fits all approach to children. 
and she brings this very personalized um, behavioral approach um, uh, to working with uh, communications in children. Um, we have um, some more of the team, Maria and Angela. Angela is our medical assistant. She is our jack of all trades here. She's really amazing um, at helping uh, with the children's during the procedures. Um, helping get IVs, blood draws if we need to. Uh, Maria is a, a certified autism specialist and she works a lot with um, getting IVs in the children as well so we can do it as safe and with as little fighting as possible. I think it's the best way to say it. <laughs> um, so us working with ASD, I'll, this will, I'll take a few minutes here to, to kind of go to, through our story. Um, so my main uh, training and background, uh, besides getting um, my degrees in medical research and in naturopathic medicine, was in orthopedics. So I started studying very, very early um, in my med in med school on how to inject different injection techniques uh, for pain, you know, musculoskeletal pain, joint pain, things like that. So. That was my niche. That was my speciality for a long time. And you're probably thinking, well, how, what the heck does that have to do with autism? Um, it really doesn't. And that is what I would tell the parents um, and grandparents that I'd, you know, I, I got people walking again, you know, out of severe pain. Um, and, and so people really trusted me in my work. And they'd say, hey, can you, um, you know, can you please do some work with stem cells and autism? And I said, I don't know anything about that. Um, it's not my specialty. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's right for me to try to do something like that, uh, for the families and the kids. And, um, after about five or six kind of nudging me, well, come on, come on, we have to go, you know, we have to go overseas and it costs us you know, like $20,000 every time we go overseas. It's just like, holy crap. Um, we're in America and you're telling me to get an, something like a stem cell treatment for autism, which, uh, as when I started talking to these parents and grandparents and reading the research, I was like, there's, I didn't even know about this, this is, but there's something there. Um, I finally, I, I gave in, I said, all right, well, let me, let me research it for a, a time. I think I spent a few months just looking into it. And um, finally I, I said, all right, let's, let's start treating a few kids and let's just see how it goes. And if it's something that's not helping, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't want to do it. I, I didn't feel ethically right about it. Um, and I guess just, you know, we ended up hitting up um, out of the, kind of a, a few home runs with our um, uh, our first few patients. I'll probably make a lot of baseball analogies. Um, but we ended up uh, doing really well with the first few kids. And that just kind of um, just took off, you know, people sharing their, uh, their story. Um, on social media, the word of mouth. And um, once people saw the convenience and affordability and how much we were doing it, um, I, I hesitate on saying better, but the difference that we were making uh, compared to some of the overseas clinics um, was just more appealing um, uh, to, to a lot of parents. I'm not offhand. I don't want that to come across as saying we are exclusively better than other clinics um, overseas or anything, but they were just more appealed to come to us. So, um, yeah, so we started doing, uh, autism full time and it kind of really just took over <laughs> for a while. I wasn't even doing orthopedics anymore. I just was seeing kids, um, and, and working with kids with autism. And then I brought in more and more, uh, other doctors and staff and stuff to help. Um, and so, yeah, we've been doing that full time. I think a common question we, is we, that we get is, how often, how many kids do you see or how many kids have you treated? Um, so I haven't sat down and counted them all yet, but it's probably in the, a couple hundred by now. Um, so like I alluded to earlier, we are the, the first clinic um, that I know of and been told first and only ones using expanded live uh, stem cells from an umbilical cord tissue um, as well as uh, their paracrine secretions, their, their, their exosomes um, and integrative medicine. So there's lots of places that will say, you, you know, we use stem cells and um, whether they are or not, we'll get to a little in this presentation, but 
Um, it's for us, it's also the addition of that integrative medicine because when I first started seeing kids, um, they had the parents had been, I learned so much from the parents. They had been there, done that on the diets and the supplements and, um, oh gosh, um, the other, you know, the natural medicines and the magnetic beds and you know, all kinds of different things that they were trying. And so that's what really, I think, set apart was they had been doing this for years, but then when they added the stem cell therapy, that made a huge difference for them. Um, so um, saying we do a stem, stem cell treatments is gets very vague. Um, so I wanted to point out that we use umbilical cord tissue derived MSCs. We don't use blood. Um, it's also known as Wharton's jelly. This is kind of gets synonymous with the just a part of the umbilical cord you're extracting these cells from. Um, so, so far, 100% of our treatments come from an, a donated umbilical cord. We haven't used a patient's own umbilical cord or their siblings' umbilical cord. And I don't have anything wrong with that. There are some thoughts uh, between myself and Dr. Rajana Holly that think a cord that a cord that comes from a child and then in 18 months, two years, whenever that kid ends up developing autism, maybe there's some genetic material that from those stem cells that we might not use. That's not conclusive. I'm not saying you shouldn't use a, a cord uh, from a child that develops autism. It's just, we don't know. We have no idea. We haven't done it. And so all of our data and patient results are from donated cords. So um, I think we will eventually, I'd, I'd like to get into using a patient's own cord. Um, if processing the cells and everything looks good. Um, but I just wanted to make sure we're clear on everything that we are doing here um, and how that might be different from somewhere else that you go. Um, so first off, I decided uh, to add this slide on legality because this is has been a, a little thorn in not only my side, but the, the stem cell and regenerative medicine side <laughs> Uh, for quite a while. There's lots of, uh, there's just rumors. There's just people that aren't, aren't clear on the legalities of stem cell medicine in the U.S. There's just fraudulent claims, which unfortunately does come from a lot of clinics overseas um, because they, that's their business. They want people to come from America and they want them to come to their clinics overseas. Um, and to, yeah, to just down or outright like lying and deceiving, which is very unfortunate. Um, I've been privy to that. There's a couple of Facebook groups that um, won't even allow their members to mention another clinic in the U.S. My name, my clinic, other doctors, uh, the members are kicked and banned and blocked from that site if you if you even discuss it. Um, and they they only refer, they only want to get patients for families to go to another clinic, which they get compensated for, I've been told. Um, so a lot of, it can get a lot of sh dirty and shady, which is very unfortunate because we are in this genuinely for the medicine and to help uh, not only kids, but just people in general, is help the families in general, because when you improve the symptoms, it's not only for the kid, it's for the parents as well. It's for their family. Uh, so you're not just treating the kid, you're also treating the family. When that child isn't sleeping, um, yeah, it affects the parents. <laughs> I have a 10 month old, I know, and I, I know uh, how it can go. So uh, yeah, so first off, you should um, you should know that there's no federal law and I've worked in, this is in conjunction with Cohen Healthcare Law Group, or their FDA and healthcare lawyers. Um, so no federal law does or ever did ban stem cell research or use in the United States. That's one that just tends to get a blanket statement. Uh, you'll hear just vague words like stem cells are illegal in the U.S. And it's just not the case. Um, another one is that they a lot of people seem to think that FDA has this complete oversight on anything done with stem cells. Um, and that's also not the case because the FDA has no jurisdiction um, over how a physician practices um, or, or what they do in their clinic. Um, uh, a lot of that is determined by uh, state law and state medical boards. So what a state medical board licenses and, and says that physician can do in that state 
Um, so the FDA would have, um, does have oversight once you start culturing or uh, producing a biologic which I think is a more apt term is call it a biologic instead of stem cells. Cause a lot of places in the U S will say, or you're doing a stem cell treatment when there's no live cells in their biological product. So I think those should be categorized more as a biologic or some other name, something else. But, um, so they oversee these, uh, third party labs, um, that are making biological products and they're selling them to other clinics or doctors or, 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 you know, businesses or whatever they're selling for mostly like clinics and doctors um so they have oversight over that they see that as you're trying to produce something to treat a specific condition or disease and that is now labeled as a drug so their oversight says well we don't want you expanding cells we don't put want you putting live cells in that here are your restrictions and regulations um, as far as you selling these products to, to other people and across state lines um, so we don't ship out, um, any kind of cell medicine or cellular, um, biologics that we make here, any of the live cells or exosomes, we don't sell them to other clinics. We're not going to sell them, uh, to patients, um, and ship them to that, to your house or anything like, or to your doctor. Um, these are used, any kind of medicine that we do is exclusively used in our practice. Um, you see me skim over anything I think I didn't cover. Yeah. Um, I think another one, I, a good a point to, to refer is the 10th amendment of our U S constitution, um, covers that the FDA has no jurisdiction and that is all dictated at the state level. Um, so, um, there's actually more Arizona state law, um, that you can, you know, look up and look into, um, if, if you're worried about the legalities of, uh, of the state medical board and what it covers. I can, I, I probably should have looked up the specific statute, but it says something in the lines of the, you know, naturopathic medical doctors in the state of Arizona um, can use regenerative and biological medicine within their capacity or something like that. Um, there's a, um, what is this house bill? I think house bill 21, 21. Um, so here's the specific section title and chapter, everything for any of those that are still more curious about the legality parts <laughs> of it. Um, and really want to look into, into that, but, uh, that comes up a lot. We, um, you know, we've been dealing with that over the years because there's a lot of misinformation out there and people think that they have to go overseas to, uh, to receive any kind of stem cell therapy for their child. Um, so I just wanted to cover that first and foremost. And then, so the next popular topic is, um, well, how do these, how do stem cells even help with, um, autism spectrum disorder? Um, so there's a few different mechanisms we think. Um, so we know that, um, MSCs do target, um, sites of injury pretty well. So for whatever cause is coming across as the etiology or the cause of why a child has autism. Um, we do know that it does exhibit a lot of pro-inflammatory um, mechanisms. So uh, the kids will generally have like a lot of inflammation in them is the simplest way to put it. And then we see things like, um, you know, if your child's nonverbal or if they're de uh, developmentally delayed, uh, you can kind of assume there might be some neurological damage, I guess, so to speak, or there's the, essentially that's the, the brain probably isn't getting enough of what it needs, um, uh, to keep growing and thriving. Uh, so cells are, have been shown the ability to, to hone the different sites and repair damaged tissue. Um, they, once transplanted, they, they're able to secrete, uh, um, the easiest way I, I like to, to make an analogy of it is they're able to secrete medicine into that environment and into our body. Uh, so if a stem cell was a doctor, um, things like exosomes and growth factors and anti-inflammatory cytokines would be the medicine that this doc, these doctors are handing out to their community. Um, uh, it, they, it, they function as a little biopharmacy, you know, if they're, they're in the, 
in the, whatever environment they end up being in, um, they secrete those um, trophic growth factors, cytokines and stuff like that I was just talking about. Um, strong, yep. So that, that's called a paracrine activity. A, par a paracrine activity is um, maybe like a lot of people will be familiar with hormone, like their hormones. Um, so like a part of your brain makes a certain hormone that ends up connecting, talking to your thyroid. Your thyroid ends up making a certain hormone that ends up talking to the rest of the cells in your body, um, ideally, uh, communicating with the rest of the cells in your in your body. And that's what we consider a, like a paracrine uh, type of response. See, MSC has been shown to be responsible for activating endogenous restorative mechanisms within injured tissues. So that's the whole mechanism. There's two big schools of thought. There's a differentiation. So that means the stem cells have an ability to change. So let's say if we're administering it, administering it for a neurological condition, um, the cells would then differentiate or change into nervous, uh, like a nervous tissue type cell or a neuron. And that it, they would be able to be most helpful by doing that. Or the other thought is that they stay a stem cell and they end up secreting this little biopharmacy that we talked about um, to support their community. Um, here's some for the, the more kind of technical um, people that are interested um, in some in, in more of like a, a picture form of um, how mesenchymal stem cells can are, are helping and influencing. And one of them is their big influence on the immune system. So we uh, talked a little bit earlier how there's, there's a lot that think autism ends up developing to like this autoimmune type condition where the, the patient's autoimmune system, it's kind of going haywire. It's, um, it's secreting, it's communicating a very inflammatory, um, reaction and, you know, as us as adults, you can know that that's kind of, you feel kind of crummy when you get sick, when you get a cold or flu, uh, your immune system has a very pro inflammatory reaction because it's trying to kill this foreign invader and you feel crappy. Right. Um, and so what do you do if you, if you have an injured joint or if you're really sick, you take an anti-inflammatory and you, you'll start feeling a lot better. Right. Uh, so that's one of the mechanisms is these stem cells modulate, not in the capacity like a steroid would, not like a suppressing the immune system, but they're modulating the immune system to be more anti-inflammatory and a very pro-inflammatory immune system can be very catabolic. So it can break down a lot of tissue where an anti-inflammatory environment can help thrive and build. So here on the left, we have autism spectrum disorders, um, how the immune cells can become unbalanced and how they communicate with the rest of the immune system um, and produce some of the symptoms that we see in autism and then how stem cells through these secretions can talk to the immune system and they'll turn off these inflammatory cytokines and promote more of an anti-inflammatory one. Um, this is the graph I had uh, designed with another scientist, um, another stem cell scientist on the process of taking an umbilical cord because that's another, people are really curious, well, how do you do that? And it's really tough to explain over the phone how you take a month long process, um, especially if I'm doing you know a 15 minute consult, which sometimes I have several to a dozen a day um, to tell that story over and over again. So I made this to, in hopes that would it would help uh, people. It's on our website. Uh, so it goes over the process of this, some of the screening that's done um, in the mom before she donates the cord, um, the testing that's done to make sure, uh, you know, there's, there's no infectious diseases um, in the cord uh, or genetic conditions or autoimmune conditions. I think they go back three generations in the parent, um, the sorting, the flow cytometry to make sure that the cells you're using are uh, a mesenchymal stem cell or sometimes some referred to as a medicinal signaling cell or a mesenchymal stromal cell. There's lots of different terminology and characterization that gets thrown around, which sometimes even drives the scientific community a little bonkers. But uh, there are certain markers on the receptors of the cell that need to be identified for it to be 
called an MSC, and that's right here. So it has to be positive for CD 73, 90, and 105, and then negative in these other ones. And these other ones, like umbilical cord blood stem cells, you'd see like a positive for this like CD 34. So there's typing uh, that needs to be done. Um, and then uh, growing the cell and making sure their morphology and shape and characterization is good. Um, and then the delivery methods, which we'll also talk about a little later. And then this is just kind of um, going over more of that physiology on what they're doing in the body to help improve the symptoms um, that we, we see in kids. Uh, so where do these come from? So you can get a lot of different stem cells. Um, from an umbilical cord, it's not completely made up of stem cells, but it does have a very rich environment. And we focus on this umbilical cord tissue uh, part, which is often called Wharton's jelly. So I'll get a lot of parents call and say, yeah, but why, you know, why can't you use the Wharton's jelly? If, if you're using the umbilical cord, I'm like, well, it's, it's the same thing, or it's the same, it's the area, uh, area from the umbilical cord that gets that terminology. Um, in the research, so we'll, um, I'll try to keep this, uh, presentation and talk as expansive and objective as possible was my goal. So I want to talk about not only what we've done and we see at our clinic, but just what does the research in general show, um, of, of how much this can help, um, ASD. Uh, so this is a study. Um, not too long ago, 2014, 10 years ago. So this is in the research world, kind of outdated, but there's been a lot going on since this and there's a lot going on before it. Um, so you can see a wide different um, set of improvements that they they see in this study, uh, visual, emotional, and intellectual responses, um, coordination, body, so body use coordination, um, adapting to change, which is probably going to, is probably meaning like sensory adaptation, um, not being freaked out as much about certain textures or walking out on the grass or, or you know, something like that. Um, they use, look like they use the car, the childhood autism rating scale. Um, so yeah, a lot of, uh, and, and, oh yeah, they use the ABC too. Um, we'll talk about some of those assessments in a little bit too. Um, so what does that mean? We talked about the paracrine effect and the immunomodulation. Uh, so this is from that study, uh, just showing what they were measuring and why they think, um, well, this is from a couple studies actually. So showing why they think it was helping, um, the improvements that they saw. And so I broke that down a little more simpler too. So, well, what does that mean? Well, it means it's, it's very anti-inflammatory. It provides medicine for a, a better brain health and immune system, and it's giving the cells, the body and tools to what they need to thrive. Um, one mechanism, if you're really curious on the science that is um, is kind of taking light a lot now is mitochondrial disease. And this is big in the autism world too, that uh, um, a lot of the, the cell, our cells, mitochondria don't function as well as maybe like they'd say a neurotypical or, or another a child's cells mitochondria does and there's some really cool research that shows uh, stem cells are able to donate a my mitochondria to these other damaged cells and the mitochondria is if you go back to like high even high school biology it's our powerhouse it's like our little engine in the cell it produces a lot of um our energy um, for the cells and for our body in general so how many cells do we need is, um, you know, an, another question that will, will come up, um, especially if a lot of families are talking to multiple clinics and there's no magical black book, really. There's nothing that says that, well, this, um, this many, this much of a dosage of a cell treatment will produce X amount of results or, or this type of results at this time. Uh, so it's really us to us, up to us doctors and, and practicing the stem cell medicine to kind of gauge um gauge what we want to do what we think would be would be best uh, there are some pretty good guidelines set forth like the international society for cell and gene therapy um say i think i think they're around three 
to 5 million cells per kilogram of body weight. Um, so we, we take that into account. We take that into the severity, the weight of the patient, um, their size, um, what their symptoms are, um, if we need more of a neurological focus versus immune system focus. So there's lots to go in that personalizes this. And I just think that's just going to be the simplest answer is it's going to need to be personalized um, as best we can. But we do have some pretty standard treatments that we've um, kind of, almost kind of like minimal guidelines that we've seen where we've tried very low dosing and it just doesn't work that well. And so we've we've increased the doses. And I think that's why we get the type of results we get. And the as fast of the results as we've gotten compared to um, other clinics that we've gotten some feedback from parents that have gone to us and other clinics. Um, uh, so yeah, so our frequent dosing in most children, unless they're really light, is to use 100 million um, stem cells a day, give or take. Um, uh, then we typically do that every one to three months, depending on how uh, frequent, uh, the patient can, can come back to the clinic if they're local or if they're out of state and most of our patients are out of state. So we have to work with those logistics of when they're able to come back. Um, and we can spread these treatments out over a long period of time, which is actually shown to be much more beneficial than just doing big doses at over a short period of time. Um, we do divide and we'll go over these different delivery methods. Uh, between intravenous, intramuscular, and intranasal procedures. And I cited a couple of studies which have shown that the repeated doses seem to be much more effective than a single dose in a treatment. Not that a single dose is bad necessarily or isn't going to do any good, but um, uh, repeated doses do seem to be better. Um, uh, so what can you expect? Um, uh, uh, most of the research and um, uh, clinically, I, th I think other uh, physicians that do this, you know, pretty full time would say you got to give it about a six month period. Uh, three to six months seems to be kind of like the Goldilocks zone for to see most of the improvements. Um, for us, for me personally, sleep typically is the first one to improve, even usually within the first day, even that night. So a lot of times the parents will come back on the second day for their treatment and they will help. How did he go? Did he, any, did he have any fever? Did he have any reaction? You know, just so we're we're making sure. And they'll no, he, he, he took a nap actually after, and then uh, we went home and or we did this and that. And then that night he slept and he stayed asleep through the whole night. He hasn't done that, you know, in a year or or whatever. Uh, so parents love that <laughs> when we see uh, uh, the sleeping improve, and it doesn't always improve that fast, um, but it's usually for me the first one I see. Um, so other other improvements we typically see within a month or so, um, you'll start seeing better eye contact, uh, increased affection, better understanding and comprehension, um, behaviorally, um, better uh, behavioral improvements, less tantrums, less meltdowns, uh, being less of a picky eater can happen. There's less sensory issues. Um, some of the things uh, some parents will just say uh, would be... There's just a light. There's a light in their eyes that I haven't seen in a long time. Or I can see things processing a lot better. I can see things starting to click there. Um, and that goes with verbalness too. So verbalness, um, expressive verbalness, them saying new words, talking, spring, uh, singing, or um, I guess singing, yeah. Singing, yeah, uh, as actually. Um, but them stringing new words together to form sentences. Usually it takes the longest um, we don't really kind of count on that until like maybe a few treatments or in that six month time frame, And that's still working with speech, um, still trying to do speech therapy back home. Uh, but sometimes you just get, man, you just get kids that for some reason it just clicks. Um, I think the soonest one we've had was a, um, like within that week or something, a kid started kind of starting to talk put say a couple words and that was like, wow. But then within uh, the next couple of weeks, he just kind of took off, started saying full sentences, being very, you know, having an actual communication uh, with him. I think he was around four or five. So what you would think, you know, that kind of talk you would have with a, a four or five year old. Um, 
So we've had some um, early bloomers, but it can take it, it. It definitely takes a while um, for communication for for the most part. Um, so here's a study. Um, so this isn't our data. This is an this is an R clinic, but this was one I took from a a study, and I think this study got retracted, which it's a lot of reasons why a study can get retracted. Um, the data, it can be anything from falsifying data to uh, they found out that there was uh, miscalculations. You know, it was, it, it was an error. Something something happened. So they'll retract the study and, and correct it. So I don't know why this study was um, retracted. Um, I think it was done by Dr. Riordan and who does really great work. Um, but I still wanted to put it up here to just show uh, the CAR scores, the childhood autism rating scale scores. So the darker line is the baseline. They took the, the assessment probably before the first treatment. Um, and then the wider line is they did it after a year. So 12 months later, and the lower the score, the better. So you can see some pretty good changes in some of the, the kids or some of the, the, they call them subjects here, but some of the research participants. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, I didn't want to only just only talk about what we see in, in the clinic, I wanted to prevent to, or to present a broader scope of what's seen in the research with stem cells um, in autism. So unfortunately, research gets tough. It's expensive. It takes a long time. Um, you don't know if, if it's the way the study is designed. You don't know if you're going to be, um, if you, maybe if you or your child is going to get the treatment or not. Maybe you get the placebo. Um, so a lot of people don't want to have to go through that. So one of the, the great things about a private clinic like us personalizing the medicine is if that's something a patient wants, they don't want conventional medicine and they elect to have an experimental procedure like stem cells, uh, then that's the conversation between the patient and the doctor. So, um, in a lot of the research, um, umbilical cord blood has been used, um, and that's not what we're using. So I can't. You can kind of translate because there's, they do serve similar functions in the cell physiology. Uh, but I, I, another interesting study was using uh, cord blood mononuclear cells. The group that added umbilical cord tissue cells had a much greater therapeutic response. So I think that's a testament that there's definitely something there that's going on with umbilical cord tissue uh, cells that is uh, that is providing a better, a more therapeutic, more therapeutic approach. I'll say, I'll keep it very diplomatic, a, be, a more therapeutic approach than say something like cord blood cells alone. Um, so how do we administer them? So we do a combination of intramuscular, intranasal and intravenous. Um, intranasal is probably usually the first one because I started doing this a few years ago for neurological conditions. And I didn't really remember anybody doing it. So I don't, I don't want to say I, 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 I certainly didn't invent it, but I might've trended it a little better um, because I get that a ton uh, of patients saying, well, well, what's this intranasal? Like none of the other clinics we're talking to has done that. And I took this as a cue uh, from neurologists. I actually got turned onto it by an interventional radiologist when talking about how to treat um, patients with like Alzheimer's and dementia and Parkinson's. And this is what they'll do for severe migraine or severe uh, cluster headache patients. This is all, they'll use a special catheter like this that targets um, a nerve bundle called the sphenopalatine ganglion over here. Um, and this nerve bundle ends up traveling right up into our brain. So it, it, you don't got to worry about the blood brain barrier blocking any of the medicine um, and works really well for delivering medicine. To the brain. So I said, well, why can't we just do that with this medicine, um, i.e. stem cells or exosomes or... Um, so this um, catheter, we mostly use in adults um, for obvious reasons. You can't, you can't ask a, a kid or a kid with autism uh, to sit still and, and let me guide this catheter back through their sinus cavity uh, so I can get it up to the, past the middle turbinate and, and squirt it in their nose. So Kids are, you know, their sinus cavity is a little smaller. So I'll show you what we use for most of the kids. Um, I use, we use that if we can get them to sit still and, and be cooperative. But 
um, some of the physiology of why I started targeting this area for the treatment is this ganglion, this collection of nerves does run right up back behind our eyes and into the brain. And so it's, it contains a lot of the autonomic nerves that go to the brain and face. Uh, so not only good for autism, it's good for a lot of neurological conditions. And we do it for, for any of any time there's neurological PTSD, Alzheimer's that we mentioned earlier, dementia, um, pain, bad headaches, um, anxiety, stuff like that. There's other ways to, that, to do those. I know, um, I'm not saying this is the only approach to do that, but, um, I, I think it's, it has significantly helped where others weren't seeing much improvement. Um, so this, um, is called a mucos mucosal atomization device, um, MAD for short. Um, let's see if I can move my face so you can see up here in the upper right, um, where I can see it. So this little soft foamy device gets kind of plugged up in the kid's nose and it atomizes, it turns it in the, the saline and the, in this case, the exosomes or stem cells um, into a spray and it's spraying it back here up into the back top part uh, to ideally be absorbed into the blood vessels and nerves in the sinuses, but also to try to target that uh, SBG, that's phenopalatine ganglion as much as we can. Um, let's see, what did I do? Um, so here's just kind of a visual guide on what those different things mean. So intramuscular is kind of like a shot, you know, like a vaccine. Uh, we normally go on the shoulder or the thighs or maybe a, in the glute, um, occasionally in the little butt. Um, uh, intravenous is opposite of a blood draw. So um, we're going inside the vein and we're administering uh, the medicine inside the vein. Um and yeah, that's what I wanted to cover with this. We don't do subcutaneous. None of these other ones apply. I just use the this picture for intramuscular and intravenous. Um, so if you were thinking, how in the heck are you going to do that with my kid? <laughs> you that is a very apt question. Um, so yes, it is very hard uh, to administer this, um, and it helps that we've done so many of them over the years. Um, so. Melatonin sometimes helps, helps call, uh, chill the kids out. We've got some natural supplements and herbal medicines that we give too. Um, if the parent wants it and signs off on it, we will administer some Benadryl. Um, and you'll see later on that that's the only time we've had a bad reaction in the child is from the Benadryl. But we also have nitrous gas, which is kind of like laughing gas that you, 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 know, you would get at the dentist's office. Um, that's been very helpful in, in, uh, you know, a lot of the children, uh, but really it's just some good old fashioned wrestling. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta grab them. We, uh, you know, it's two or three of us with the parents. Sometimes we're just, we're just holding them down. Um, so that's, that's my, that's why I stay fit nowadays. Um, so I wanted to go over the differences between, uh, clinics because, Parents are shopping. They want the best for their kid, of course. Um, they want to know, oh, why would I come to you? You know, uh, so and so is, you know, they go to overseas to this or that clinic. And I don't want to, I'm not going to name any, I don't really want to name any clinics for good or bad. Um, uh, but um, so I, I, I made this list what, what is really significant that can differ pretty big between clinics. So dosing is one. Um, we went over the kind of those general dosing guidelines earlier. Um, we showed you what we mostly do in kids with autism. And I stick with that dose because I was doing low, I started doing low doses. Mainly it wasn't, it wasn't a clinical judgment. It was because parents either couldn't afford or they didn't want to pay a lot. So they just wanted to spend a little bit and we would do small amounts of cells in the, in the kids. And I just, after, you know, after going through some and it was just a night and day comparison, we just didn't see the results that we were seeing when we were doing what I guess would call higher doses. Um, even though to us, it's not really that high, but, um, so we went back to kind of standardizing, like we're, we're just going to do this because this is working and I just don't want a family to travel all the way here from New York or something and just do a, do a, get their expectations up, do a small dose. 
and then go back and be like, yeah, we're not seeing any results in our kids. Like so-and-so, when we saw these people seeing results and you got to have that awkward conversation of like, yeah, well, they, they did a higher dose. I'm like, oh, well, we should, why did you tell that, make us do that? Or we didn't know we could have done it or something like that. So we kind of started trying to standardize the dosing a little bit, but you know, it varies, you know, some clinics are charging $20,000 for somewhere around 50 to 60 million cells where that kind, you know, that would get you around 600 million cells with us. So that's a huge disparity. Um, so dosing matters, cost, um, like we just went into, you know, with some clinics going as high as the twenties and thirty thousands per treatment. Um, or if you're there for like three days, I would say that's three treatments versus, you know, we would be like 50% of that. Like our three treatment schedule for 300 million cells is 11,500. So that's a lot of money. That's a big difference. Um, and then with cost, cheaper isn't always better. There's a lot of clinics popping up um, that are just, you know, that are just marketing like maybe a few, oh, it's just a few thousand dollars. They're really marketing and budgeting the cost factor. But once you look in what you're getting, like you're not, probably not, you might, you might not be getting live cells. You might be getting a really, really small dose if you're getting any cells. Um, you know, you might not even know what you're getting, which is very unfortunate and, but true. Um, another thing to think about is the accessibility. If we know multiple treatments are typically better, um, and have shown better results, how, how often are you going to be going to the clinic you're going to? Um, uh, so accessibility is big. Um, you know, how far are you going to have to travel? Are you going to be able to stay there? Um, if you're going out of the country, um, it's a lot more complicated to travel the country. You're in an area, you know, where you don't, it probably English isn't their first language or, you know, there's, you know, you gotta worry about danger in the area, being a tourist. Um, I've heard some, I've heard some black, yeah, ugly stuff. So it, it can suck. So yeah, it's something that families need to be uh, aware and be careful of. Um, administration methods. We went over our administration methods. We do get asked us a lot why we do it this way. Um, why we do intramuscular because the cells, uh, stay in the body a lot longer and they're able to secrete those paracrine secretions over a longer period of time. Um, so there's reasons why we do, we always administer each of the different administrations if we can, unless we can't get an IV on a kid, then we'll just do intramuscular and, and intramuscular has some really, really great, um, results. Actually, I have one of the papers I keep on my desk that I refer to, uh, Skeletal muscle as a delivery route for mesenchymal stromal cells. So this was done, I think, yeah, out of Toronto, um, the University of Toronto. That's a really great read um, if you want to do that or if you have trouble sleeping and you just want to read a research paper. Um, uh, so the administration method definitely definitely makes it can make a huge factor. And I know a lot of clinics are like they'll only do in IV. And it's not that you can't get um, any good results from IV we just want, we want to increase that probability of success. So um, another thing is additional care. What kind of additional care is offering? Are you traveling a really far away and you're paying a lot of money to only get a stem cell treatment? Or, you know, we, we know there's lots of things that goes into autism. Um, so if you're just banking on that stem cell to cure a lot of the autism symptoms that you know may not go as well as you were hoping it would go because your child has dysbiosis or um, heavy metals or, to you know, environmental toxins or something. Uh, so what kind of additional care are you getting with um, uh, with that? So what's the difference between us and other clinics? Um, so we do use live and expanded um, cells. Um, our affordability, like, we, like I touched on, tends to be um, a, a lot more affordable than most clinics. Um, high accountability for, for greater care. Since we're here in the States, we, you know, it's people need to leave. We need to have good word of mouth. We need to have good Google reviews. It's much easier for us to get reported. Whereas if something goes wrong after you get home from an overseas clinic, who are you, who are you going to call? <laughs> um, you know, you, you who are you going to report? You know, so um, uh, it's, we have a pretty high standard for us to do good. Uh, our integrative approach provides a much better and holistic approach. Um, and we have a great experienced staff in, in dealing with kids and treating autism. And 
just be on the record. I'm not saying any overseas clinics are bad. They're not good. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just delivering information for uh, parents uh, to make informed decisions. Um, so what are some of the questions you should probably be asking when you, when you call and talk to these clinics? Um, side effects. Uh, what are the side effects that you've seen? Um, is it, you know, is this going to be safe for my child? Um, are my, is my child receiving live stem cells, which a lot of this research reflects, or are they receiving a biological product or exosomes only, or if it's live stem cells, where are they coming from? Is it umbilical bone marrow, um, you know, adipose tissue, is it placenta cells? Um, um, you, do you do this? Do you do this pretty often? How, how often? Um, I had an orthopedic patient say, um, ha had to come to me for her back problems after going to a clinic in Mexico. Um, because she says she found out that the doctor that did her back injection was actually a gynecologist and had no orthopedic training whatsoever. And she just gave her a couple shots in the back, you know, like intramuscular shots. And I was like, that's not how you fix the problem. Uh, but that's not the best way. I should say that's not the best way you should go about fixing your problem. So, you know, are they are they experienced in treating ASD? Um, yeah, you just you, you're going to have to get familiar with dosing and um, what kind of cells and you know the dosing guidelines. Uh, talking in volumes and units is not a dosing. So a lot of clinics will say we'll give you three c, we'll give you two cc's of stem cells each day. That doesn't tell me anything. I can, in two cc's of fluid, I can give 100 million stem cells or I can give 300 million uh, stem cells. So that's not a dosing. So when clinics, I've told people, when clinics tell you that, just hang up um, or just say, you know, thanks for your time um, because they're not, they're, they're not using cells most often unless for some reason they are. And that's just how they're doing it. That's just how their approach is to, to give a volume instead of the actual cell account. Um, but just make sure you know if there's an actual cell account and if that cell amount um, is referring to live stem cells or a total nucleated count, which could just be white blood cells. It could be fibroblasts. It could be a bunch of different cells. Um, and if there's any other care given, kind of, kind of, I feel like my time's running out. Getting close for sure. Am I, am I getting close? Um, okay. Um, so let's go over some safety, um, overall, um, from meta-analysis and systematic reviews. So that's where, these are where they take all these studies, um, here are all these different studies. So they go through all the different studies that they can and they decide which ones are the best. Um, and they use those studies and then they look, um, so for this one, for instance, for safety. Um, so they pulled a bunch of studies together and, um, reported on how safe it was. So, um, really safe overall, you know, no evidence of, or susceptibility to infection, unless the clinic doesn't know what they're doing and they don't clean like a site or something, but, um, you know, anyone experienced shouldn't be doing that. Um, fever, um, was transient, was the most common reported side effect and usually didn't last long. Um, you know, no association between stem cell treatments and tumor formations, um, you know, no infusional toxicity, which is another big one. So you're using a donated cell from somebody else's umbilical cord. Won't that interact with my child and like cause a big immune reaction and, and have them get really sick? Um, you know, this is just showing things like that. Like, no, it's pretty well documented that the cells that come from umbilical cord tissue um, are well tolerated in the body. That doesn't mean some sort of immune reaction won't happen, but it's not the one that a lot of opponents of umbilical cord cells make it out to be in using kind of a scare factor technique. Um, uh, so this study found um, for out of 296 intravenous infusions, these were the majority of any adverse events or side effects. You can see fatigue, uh, which we do see a lot. Um, I would say we do see a lot of fatigue. Um, headache is kind of hard to re get reported in a child, um, especially if non-communication. So, um, low grade fever, we see a lot of increase in anxiety. I, I would agree with that one as a mild event. Um, they just can, can be a little more hyper, um, increase in obsessive compulsive behavior. That stuff does happen. It usually is transient. It usually doesn't last long, maybe a few days or weeks. 
I know we had, I can recall one where she was like, the parents were like, you know, we're not just really seeing anything really good. Um, um, they're communicating a lot more, but they're not really following our directions or telling what we, what we say. And I was like, well, it sounds like they're starting to think for themselves more. So um, I can't help you at that one. I, I apologize. You're just going to, you know, that's some behavioral stuff you're going to have to do at home. Um, uh, so some side effects, yeah, like I said, um, hyperactivity, headaches, low-grade fevers, um, vomiting. Um, we had to lower the dose on our IV cells because we were noticing the higher the, the higher doses of IVs tend, did tend to have some vomiting. It usually was right after, and we can't... So we lowered the dose to be safe, but we couldn't really tell if it was the dose from the stem cells or if it was just from the kid screaming, crying, like really getting worked up um, and really anxious. And I have a friend and her little, uh, her little girl gets like that. She gets, has a fit, she, she'll throw a fit. And we were out camping, big group of us. And she called it too. She goes, she's smart. She's going to throw up. And I, she's sick. It was wrong. And she's like, no. And she breaks down. She didn't get something that she wanted or something. She wanted like candy for breakfast, like very typical kid. And uh, mom said no. And so she was throwing a fit and she was like, oh God, now she's going to throw up. And sure enough, she was out, she was stomping her feet. She was crying and, and she just went Bleh, and threw up right, right, like right there. And, uh, and so, yeah, it might be that we, the reason we see vomiting occasionally is just because these kids don't want to get a shot. They don't want to get held down. Um, and so we did have one moderate to severe uh, reaction. Um, the parents wanted us to administer uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl uh, to kind of sedate or calm the, the child down for the uh, treatment. She ended up having to go to the ER. Um, when we got to the ER, I talked to the toxicologist and the ER doctors, and they said, despite the very, very low dose, so it was about 25% of the actual dose we would give a child um, she just had like an allergic reaction. She just had some sort of, um, reaction to the Benadryl. Um, so that was very unfortunate, uh, but very luckily for us, that's the only time that we've ever seen anything even remotely moderate or severe. Um, but she ended up, she's, she's doing fine. She got out of the hospital like the next day or two. Um, I, um, I think we got to follow up with her, but as far as I know, she's doing, she's doing fine now. Um, so what do stem cells look like? Well, here they are. Um, I've got a great YouTube video. If you want to go to our YouTube channel, I'll do a shameless plug and say, please subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel. Um, but we're putting out a lot of stuff, not only with stem cells, but just with regenerative medicine and, and health in general. So it is a good channel to uh, to be informed on. But I've got, I show, I have a whole video where we're actually processing the cells. So um that's what I think that's about 300 million stem cells. So that's probably about the, uh, like the tip of my finger, um, once they get all collected. And then these are a couple staining methods, tripen staining. Uh, this is, uh, a, a fluorescent staining, um, just to show you viability, you know, a lot of people, Oh, that's another big one. So another people, a lot of people hate the fact that they think frozen cells are always dead. And that's not true. You don't, don't listen to the marketing gimmicks where some people are telling you, you have to have fresh cells versus frozen. Um, these are post-thawed. Uh, so we say post-thawed. So after we thaw the cells and we take a measurement of them, these are those viability and cell counts. So uh, that one says the, mm, what's this, 95%. Uh, this one, we actually had a hundred percent reading in a still small sample, which is great. That doesn't always happen. Um, usually anywhere from 93, 95% or higher is excellent. Anywhere 90% would be even a really good, you know, a cell biologist would say, that's great. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that we got that amount of cells after thawing. So again, emphasizing, you really got to go to a place that is, is working with this, is knowing, is, knows what they're doing. Um, they look close up on the cells. Um, so the green is the, is what the software is, what the computer, the microscope is, is counting as live. And the red is what they would say is, is dead um, or is an artifact. Sometimes they, it just, it's not reading as a live cell, which happens. It just, it just happens. Like there's, there's, there's no way to can, you know, you thaw cells, like some of them are going to die. Um, 
this is a reading of um, uh, like a, um, a sterility kind of report. Like if there's any infections in um, in the sample, and you can see the depth of what gets tested for. Um, a lot of viruses, a lot of bacteria, a lot of mycoplasma. Um, this was done, yeah, not too long ago. We sent this one off in May of this year. Uh, this is something called a flow cytometry analysis. Uh, so this is showing you, this is in, including how to make sure it's a, the type of stem cell. There's so many different types of stem cells, but this is how to make sure it's the type of stem cell that you're using. Um, let me get a little quick. Um, I know I'm running a little behind, so I'm going to get a little faster. Um, we talked about integrative medicine, uh, and I wanted to give you as much information as I can so that you can walk away with this, with something and not feeling like you had to come be a patient here to, to benefit. Um, but these are a lot of the popular diets, um, that, um, have shown success. Again, it, it's, it varies. I've had parents do gluten, uh, gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free, dairy-free for a year, and they didn't notice any difference. Um, so it's important to, you know, to see somebody that knows these nutritional deficiencies or, or how to work with nutrition. Let me go back to the FODMAPs. The FODMAPs, um, I'll talk about actually a little later, um, is a specific diet that a lot of parents aren't familiar with, as familiar with some of the others. Uh, but has worked really good with me. Um, uh, so organic or not? Yeah. So organic is huge. Um, um, so re a lot of research specifically showing how chemicals like glypho glyphosate um, was, was under a organophosphate category, which is Roundup. It's the pesticides sprayed onto the foods. So why organic is so important on certain foods so you don't get those pesticides accumulated in the system. Um, but we see um, evidence of it causing autism-like behavior, not only in mice, but in also children. Um, there's a huge lawsuit now against Tylenol. Um, I don't know about the lawsuit against amoxicillin, but I know there's one against Tylenol and it causing autism symptoms. So definitely look, in, in, uh, look into this, talk to your doctors about it. Um, this is definitely something we talk to. I, I hope we talk to all of our patients about it. I would definitely talk to any of my autistic patients about it. Um, here's a really cool graph. So the red line is the use, the amount of glyphosate, a pesticide that we started using on corn and soy in the US. And the yellow bar is the rates of autism that have increased through the, you know, since the early 90s. So um, as I guess, I don't know, a scientist or a doctor or some, you know, person in the scientific field, we know that correlation doesn't always equal causation, but these numbers are a little bit too hard to ignore. So to be safe, I would just say stick with a, um, as much of an organic diet, or at least look up the clean 15 or the dirty dozen in the clean 15. So the dirty dozen are the foods that, are, that usually are sprayed with the most pesticides. Um, so you want to get those organic and the clean 15, a lot of pesticides aren't used on those. So you're usually safer off getting those non-organic if like something like budget or something or availability is an issue. So the microbiome, microbiome in GI, GI disorders in ASD, the microbiome is essentially your gut bacteria. So you hear about probiotics, but we, um, we have this, this ecosystem in our gut of bacteria and super important for our health. And it's been on a lot of like more people like naturopathic doctors and, and holistic practitioners and probably functional medicine doctors radar for years, but it's starting to get a lot more popular conventionally too. Um, so a lot of people ask me about the fecal transplants. Um, so that's where you take, uh, somebody else's poop that has, um, uh, a bunch of good bacteria in it and you transplant it into the kid. There's actually a company called Ceno, Ceno Biotic that they've encapsulated sterilized um, feces. I know you're you're swallowing a kind of a poop pill. There's no other way around it. But um, this makes huge improvements in in children. Um, sometimes this alone. So we always run a stool sample. Oh, we don't always, but 
we try to run stool samples on almost every ASD kit to, to look at that ecosystem and see and how it could be contributing to their uh, repetitive stereotypical behaviors. Um, um, I'm going to skip this because I don't want to take up. I've already gone. I'm going over time. Um, so clearing up the gut improves, can improve symptoms in, in autism. Definitely. So I think that's another reason why we get such significant results is because we're working on this from multiple different facets. Um, here's some of the physiology on um, the gut brain access. So what's going on in our gut is translated to our brain through our hormones, through our, our nervous system, uh, through our immune system. Um, so it's, it's, it's a huge thing. Um, that's not that, not that well known. Let's just read this real quick. A predisponence of evidence suggests that a significant subset of autistic individuals exhibit GI abnormalities and that GI issues can contribute to the clinical manifestations of ASC symptoms, including abnormal behavior, immune dysregulation, and metabolic dysfunction. I 100% agree with that. Uh, I'll go over some of the gut health results right now. So SIBO and dysbiosis and parasites. Oh my, there is a lot going on in kids with um, ASD that we see. So I'm going to go over a couple quick um, samples. So this was a patient of ours. Um, this is one of our earlier ones that we did a stool sample on. So this was in 21, seven of 21. So you can see she's low in the normal bacteria. So this is what we want to see as like normal, not necessarily high, undetectable limits of acromancia. This is a really important um, uh, bacteria to have in our gut to provide protection. And you can see she's already got some opportunistic. We call this opportunistic because in the right environment, they will thrive and they will take over. Um, and you may think like, well, this isn't really that high. That's to the fifth power and that's to the fourth. But you got to realize how it, it's it's high, you know, that's like a, a times a million, you know, so. Um, so we wanted to work. So mama was scared of um, stem cells at first. So she wanted to use really low doses um, and she was doing a lot of her own thing. Um, and I'm just pointing this out because I, I've seen a lot of moms and dads too like this. Um, that they you know they got their own thing i want to do this i want to do that uh, and so we can see when we did another one in 11 uh a three oh what's that um th th four months later so she now she is hiding e coli um she we did do some probiotic supplements so you can see this normal bacteria getting up higher but now she has a ton of dysbiotic overgrowth um so and and now we, we're seeing uh strains that uh, show as potential autoimmune conditions like Proteus. And now we have Candida. So we have a, so fungus in there too, or some yeast in there too. So, um, so she, she eased up. Um, she let us do the treatments we wanted to do and we increased the amount of stem cells. And so this is 11, so that's 12, one, two. So it's about another three months later. Um, this is what we see. So really good that E. coli is, is gone, that um, normal fl flora is picking up is uh, still a couple low, but still good, a lot better than she was. And you can see all this, uh, bad bacteria, this overgrowth has really cleaned up a lot, except for that streptococcus, which can be really, uh, difficult. And it can, it can take a long time because of the biofilm. Um, but, um, it, it is really important to focus on these other, um, uh, therapies, uh, so let me wrap up with our costs. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before, um, you know, clinic, it can range from a couple of thousand to tens of thousands of dollars per treatment. So make sure you know how much you're paying per treatment, or that's for the total cost of, of all the treatments. I like to keep it simple. I like, we like to have a set amount of cells that we're going to use. And then we don't nickel or dime for, you know, for maybe a lab here and there or some supplements or the doctor's time or something like that. Um, and yeah, insurance, don't call and ask if insurance covers it. We, we tried that. Um, we, we tried actually, but for about a year, we really tried working and talking to patients, insurance companies. And as, um, as our clever office manager, Amrique says, 
Um, it's not that we don't take them, they don't take us. Um, so I don't know if I even want insurance to ever cover. Um, I feel like that's that's not the probably the best approach. But here's our typical cost um, for the amount of sales and and um, you know any additional treatments we might give um, for whatever dysbiosis or something you know something like that. Um, so you know you can see where you know we're uh, for about the same price as you get for three treatments, you get twelve treatments. You know. Um, for a, a certain overseas clinic or, or some some of the overseas clinics. Um, here's a lot of the references for those that love to research. Maybe I'll just leave, leave that up and y'all can look at that if you want to. Um, but I'm gonna take some um, questions um, right now. Uh, so I really appreciate you. Um, let me open my screen, let me open my Zoom. I uh, appreciate y'all uh, tuning in for the presentation with us. And um, yeah, definitely um, let us know of um, any questions or something if you want to call. Um, oh, I didn't even put a slide with our contact. Um, that's bad form. Um, so Innate Healthcare Institute, we're in Phoenix, Arizona. We are um, located about 15, 20 minutes outside of the Phoenix airport. So we're technically in Scottsdale. Uh, but we're right on the border of like Phoenix and Scottsdale. And um, our phone number is 602-603-3118. And our website is innatehealthcare.org. So I can figure out how to get back. And I'm sorry, it's not giving me the option to unshare my screen. There we go. There we go. Okay. Dr. Travis Whitney, thank Sorry, you Josh. so much for such an informative, packed conversation or presentation. You made my job so easy because you answered a lot of, of questions that I think a lot of parents have. So, yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I think um, I have like one or two questions. Um, we have run a little bit over time. Um, okay. I think one of the, the main questions um, is that there are parents who um, have perhaps not heard of stem cell, stem cell therapy and are scared to, to try this. What is your message to, to those parents who are still hesitant? Um you know, do your research. There's lots of, there's lots of, um, groups out there. Uh, I know there's Facebook groups. I know there's, there's probably lots of Reddit forums. There's probably lots of different, uh, support groups where you can make sure you feel comfortable before this is something, uh, that you do make sure the place that you're going is pretty well vetted for, you know, you can do that. You know, maybe word of mouth, Google reviews, they should have testimonials. Um, but really, you know, don't don't go out and seek this out until you have a really good gut parent feeling, that parent intuition that this is what you know it would be good for you and your in your family. Um, definitely, definitely take advantage of um, talking to the place you're intending on going. Um, they make make sure they answer any questions you have. A lot of time, my free 15 minute conversations end up 30 minutes easily um, because I do try. We do try to spend that extra time to make sure um, everything they're comfortable. We have a really comprehensive frequently asked questions uh, section on our page specifically for autism and for stem cell therapy in general. That might be really worth some parents checking out and, and going over that. And that might help them be able to talk. Uh, to others if there is ever any any apprehension or they are a little scared but yeah you know do your homework it's a it's a it's a big thing to undergo so fantastic i loved how open you were about the research and potential side effects and the likelihood of of things like that happening and and being very transparent in the process do you think it is important to especially when people are hesitant to be so um open and transparent um, are you talking about other practitioners or cl clinics? I'm talking about in general. Um, oh, I mean, yeah, in general, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah, you're right. In general, yes, it, it's super important to be transparent. Um, 
you were talking about children's health here. Um, if you're if you're not transparent, if if somebody's like, oh yeah, we can treat autism, well, you can treat autism. I'm not doubting that you can treat it, but do you treat it? Are you experienced in treating it? You know, if somebody was to say, I, we can do it, yeah, you know, you need to be transparent. How you know, families are traveling to you, they're spending a lot of money, like they're putting their 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 child's health, you know, in in your hands. Um, so yeah, transparency is huge. Um, and costs, you know, like, you know, with, with spending, uh, what's the cost of the treatment or treatments? Is it something else going to be added on later? Um, what am I getting for my cost? You need to be transparent about that. Is there any way before a child starts um, this therapy, is there any way to predict um, what the effects will be or what improvements parents can see? There is a there is a little bit, and it might be considered a little anecdotal because, as far as I know, I haven't gotten this or that I haven't seen anything out there where it's like a peer reviewed research that shows kind of the healthier the kid is. If the kid is is detoxed, if if they have like a ton of environmental toxins or heavy metals in their system, there's some thought that something like stem cells might not work as well. Um, so usually since it takes about, you know, it can take a month or two to get in to see us. A lot of times we'll just tell patients, like, go see your, you know, functional medicine doctor, go, or we'll tell the families, go see, you know, so-and-so if you're working on detoxing and stuff like that and do that if you can before. There's no, you know, I know I, another, it gets I'm not frustrating in the bad sense. But it's frustrating because I don't have an answer, but I get frustrated sometimes if parents are like, well, when, when do we bring him? When do you know to bring him in? You don't. Um, there's no perfect time uh, that we know of, I think, to, that says, oh, yeah, now they're ready for the, the cells now. But if you can get, uh, um, you know, a lot of maybe the dysbiosis cleared up or um, um, any toxin accruement from like environmental or heavy metals or something or. Uh, the diet cleaned up, you know, if the kids only eat chips and chicken nuggets every day, it's probably causing a lot of gut inflammation. So some say it's a lot better to take care of that before stem cells. Personally, I can't test testament to that a hundred percent because I, we get a lot of kids that are, that have the gut problems, the heavy metals and everything they're eating super picky. I had one kid, not, not only would he eat chicken nuggets, but he had to have Chick-fil-A chicken nuggets. Like it's the only kind of chicken nuggets he would eat. Um, and I'm like, right on, man. I, I, I know, I know what you're feeling, but, um, and we still get really, really great benefits. So, but to answer your question, that, that is a thing. So in your, in your practice now, um, at the innate Institute, what are some of the biggest, um, improvements that you have seen in a child? I know you went through some of the, the common improvements, but what can you recall one or two cases, perhaps, um, that are really standing out for you? Yeah. Um, the one I mentioned earlier, um, developing language just within a couple of weeks, that was huge. Um, um, I mean, I could, you just open a big can of worms because I could go on for a long time if we sit there and if I ask the staff to come in and bring up some other ones, but yeah, you know, um, things like within the next couple of weeks, like just making eye contact or um, being more affectionate. You know, that's one of the ones I didn't actually, I, I don't know if I touched on that, but that's, I haven't seen that in any of the research studies um, as being a primary target, but affection, cuddling, kissing, hugging their parents, grandparents, um, playing with siblings and other kids. Um, that is, I think, probably one of the most significant ones where in a couple of weeks, you know, we would talk back to the parents and they're like, well, he's, he's not talking or anything yet, but oh my, he's just so sweet. He cuddles with us now. He kisses us. He would, our, his grandparents came over and he never paid any attention to his grandparents. It was like they weren't even there. And the second they came over, he grabbed their hands and walked them over to the toys he was playing with. So little stuff like that is, I mean, it sounds little, but it's huge. Um, it's huge in the future development of that kid as well. Not just it happening, but you know, for their, for their, their outcome and for the family's outcomes, you know, and how they interact with them and who they are as a person. 
So yeah, I can think of a lot. Um, I can, um, one of the patients that also um, had a lot of ASD, but was very undergrowth, had an underdeveloped kidney. And so uh, she was going to have to have surgery eventually to have that kidney replaced if it didn't start growing. And about within, probably within six to eight months, I think she had another test done and her, ki her kidney was growing. Um, so don't, that was huge. She didn't have to have a kidney replacement. Um, and she was, she's able to live. I knock on wood. She's able to live her life with both fully functional kidneys. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, and for the viewers, we will definitely have this presentation up on our website. I know you had to, um, scan through those last slides quite quickly so people can look at it a bit closer yeah um and and do their own research this especially with regards to the your last slide the the research studies that you that you presented mm -hmm. uh dr travis whitney thank you so much for your time this was an absolutely fabulous conversation fascinating um, and I know um, a lot of parents got value out of this um, and certainly were were educated on on something that can seem very scary and daunting and and you've really simplified it and and explained it in a very accessible manner. So thank you so much.